the voices. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faith. Sing that again. Great is thy, oh great, oh great is thy faithfulness. Lord unto me. Amen. That is one of my favorite songs, and it does remind us of the faithfulness of God. As we go into a time of prayer, I'd encourage you to recall God's faithfulness uh, to each of us. I was thinking, as uh, Kayla mentioned, your sister's home burned down. One of Sarah's, maybe this happened in Colorado, one of Sarah's friends, her home got caught up in that fire. And I was thinking there while we were singing, sometimes it's hard to convince to our children how how thankful we should be for having a warm place 
to live, warm food to eat. Uh, when we heat that house with electricity, propane, we're not out cutting wood, and then you have other disasters taking place in other parts of the country, forest fires in, or prairie fires in Colorado, tornadoes in Kentucky, Illinois, and places like that. We uh, live in a, in a world that God has created. It is an awesome world, isn't it? And we are thankful for the ways in which God has used us and placed us to be in it. And we should be reminded that in the sovereignty of God, uh, we, we need to be thankful for the blessings that he gives to us because he is very thankful. He is very faithful beyond what we deserve. And so I sometimes wonder, am I communicating that well to our children? Just how faithful God is to us and how much we should be grateful to him. And so I'd like to go back to Psalm 99 um, that we started out with. It's a psalm that's interesting. It's got three refrains, really, and each refrain ends with, He is holy. And so as we continue our worship before Him, uh, as we pray, as we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, I want to keep in mind that uh, He is holy. And because He is holy, He is faithful to us. And the psalmist writes that God answered Moses and Aaron out of the cloud, and He said to them, you were to them a God who forgives. Though you took vengeance on their deeds, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Let's pray as we remember our holy God is a God who forgives and is a God who is faithful to us in that mercy of forgiveness. Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to gather as your people, uh, your sons and daughters who have been uh, called by name. You understand the various challenges that we each face. You understand uh, the temptations that beset us. You understand all them, but to be people who are uh, worshipers. And Lord, though we long to be faithful, we recognize that it's your faithfulness that is what ultimately sustains us. And so as we come before you, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, convict us of sin that we would be those who would repent of that sin and recognize that it's only by your grace and by your mercy that we can understand this forgiveness that was promised by the psalmist. And it's only by this, Lord, that we can recognize that it's your holiness that is our hope. And so, Lord, I just ask as we each come before you privately that this would be a time of confession, but also a time of thanksgiving for your mercy. Lord, we are grateful that you are faithful and just to forgive us. And Father, we also want to continue as we uh, consider your great works within this world. Some of them immediately spark praise and worship. Some of them uh, cause us to have concern and to fear what will be the end of this. And Lord, we just lift up those who have lost homes, be it in Colorado, Illinois, Kentucky, other places due to uh, disasters. Lord, we pray that you would provide for those needs. We ask that you would lift up your church in all those places to be uh, ministers of mercy, ministers of the gospel in ways in which, uh, so that they might represent the ways in which you meet those needs. Father, we also pray that you would be uh, within this community here. Uh, we recognize that there are those who are sick. Lord, we continue to ask for your healing, that you would sustain our health, that you would uh, equip us to be uh, vigilant for those who need help. Uh, Father, we pray that you would also be with our leadership here as they continue to navigate. And we're thankful for the, uh, the ways in which they try to look out for our well-being. And so we ask, Lord, that your support and wisdom would be upon them. And Father, as we continue to uh, worship you this morning, I ask that you would lift up uh, the preaching of your word, that you would give uh, uh, Jeff the insight and your spirit, Lord, that he might communicate uh, these great truths of the scripture to us, that we would be uh, thankful, that we would leave here with a thankful heart for the ways in which you have communicated to us, that you have set out a path that we might go, that we might recognize that though we are not holy, we can step into your presence uh, by the righteousness of Christ 
that we might marvel in your holiness. And Father, we also ask that as we continue to uh, worship with our tithes and offerings, that you would bless those, that they would be used to equip the people here, that they would use to, again, um, communicate your grace and your glory within this community and even beyond. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeff reminded me that I failed to uh, give the announcements. Um, the first being that we, we do have children's church today, and so children ages four through fifth grade. Uh, if you'll see Carl Tillery in the back, you may go back and join him and begin children's church. Um, as I mentioned earlier this morning at the beginning of worship, we are going to launch into a series on the Ten Commandments. I believe Jap and Jeffries gave an introduction last week, and so uh, Pastor uh, Jeff Smith will be giving the message on the first commandment. Uh, after that, we will have fellowship in the back, but they ask that we keep our, ma our masks on, and then there are donuts back there, but take the donuts on your way out. Don't eat them here. That's part of the, uh, the protocol that we're trying to... Uh, incorporate for safety. If there are no other announcements, are there any things? Okay, next, one more. Next week, we do not have Sunday school, is that correct? Okay, no Sunday school next week. And with that, I will turn it over to Chaplain Smith. Amen, well, good morning. It's a joy for me to be back and to see each of you here this morning. If you'll grab a copy of God's Word, <laughs> And turn with me to Exodus 20 while I get this situated. Exodus chapter 20, as we continue on in our study of the Ten Commandments and looking at uh, the very first commandment. Um, and so as you are turning there, I believe you will find this, if you don't have a copy of God's Word in front of you, on page 80. There you go. Page 80 on the Pew Bible. This is Exodus chapter 20, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Here's the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And Lord, add a blessing to the reading of his word. As has already been mentioned, if you were here with us last week, you know that we began this great study into the book of the, or the uh, idea here of the Ten Commandments. Uh, certainly the Ten Commandments is a, a very glorious um, uh, understanding, the glorious understanding of God's law and what it means for us. And uh, if you're like most people, um, especially in some of them, it's a struggle really to just understand understand what some of the commandments really and fully mean, and also how we are to obey those commandments, how we are to submit and live out in light of those commandments. Certainly this was the case of uh, Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson wrote a book by the name of Loving God. In it, uh, he was referring to Jesus's words in the Gospels when he was approached by a, uh, a leader of the law and, and simply said, what is the greatest commandment? And those of you who remember, he just simply said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. And he says, this is the greatest and first commandment. Um, and then if you're familiar with the text, he goes on and he mentions that to love your neighbor as yourself. That is the second great commandment. And those of you who are familiar know that we can divide the Ten Commandments based upon those two. All right? The first four commandments are all vertical. They all help us to understand how we are to relate to God. 
And then the last six help us to understand how we are to relate to one another in gospel community. Um, but Chuck Colson, as he was trying to understand each of these commandments, primarily the first, and understanding what does it mean to put God first? What does it mean to love God? And he says that I memorized that verse over and over again, and I really tried to understand what did it mean to fulfill that command. And he wondered if he was the only one. And he wondered if some of his closest friends um, who maybe had experienced more of God, uh, how they loved God. And so he did a quick survey to some of his closest friends. And I'll read this. I'll quote him. He says, the cumulative effect of my survey convinced me that most of us as professing Christians do not really know how to love God. Not only have we given thought to what the greatest commandment means in our day-to-day -day experience, we have not obeyed it. Once again, I would submit that it's not just an issue with Chuck Colson's closest friends, it's an issue with all of us. Truly trying to understand the in and outs of each of these commandments, what do they mean, and then what place we have in our life. And uh, this is really what we're looking at this morning as we focus our attention on the very first commandment, wanting to understand what does that first commandment mean and how are we in Christ to obey it. Certainly, those of you who are familiar know that God had delivered the nation of Israel out of Egypt and the nations in that day certainly were polytheistic. They worshiped many gods Egypt, I am told, was king, if you will, of those nations. And one article noted that they themselves had over 2,000 deities. But God, having delivered his people, called them out, and he says very clear to them in a very simple command, you, my people, will have no other God. That is his simple command. What I want us to see and understand as we look at our text today is that God is to be sought, worshipped, and enjoyed exclusively. He is to have our number one priority in all of our life, not just Sunday morning, not just part of each day, but all of our day, all of our life. As one person says, there is room but for only one throne in our heart, and God and God alone should occupy that throne. As we look at our text this morning, we're going to try to answer the, uh, our, our question here, what does the commandment really mean for us? We're going to answer it really with two points. And those of you who are note takers, if you'd like to write this down, you're more than welcome. Verses 1 and 2, we will see what's known as the preamble, how it is revealed, the commandments are revealed out of knowing God personally. And then we will look at verse 3 and we will see that this required action is to seek God exclusively. And then we want to try to answer the second question, how can we keep this commandment? And this is what I want you to see, that the simple fulfillment lies in looking to Christ uniquely. Looking to Christ uniquely. So let's look at the first question together. What does it mean in this commandment to have no other God before us? Really, first, we have to understand the context of how it is revealed. And again, we see this in verses 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words, verse 2, saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Notice at the very beginning, those words in verse, verse 2, I am the Lord the Lord. Notice how the Lord is spelt there. The Lord there, as it is pronounced, as it is written, is implying to us, telling us that this is God's covenantal name. This is the personal name of God that we refer to and know of as Yahweh. This was the respected revered name of God, so much so that within the Jewish community, they would not say it and they would not write out his name, Yahweh, rather they would use this name, Lord. But when he says this, I am the Lord, he is revealing to us who he 
is. Don't lose sight of that. He is saying, I am the Lord. And remember as God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, and Moses, as he was being called, said, who would I say that is sending me? And God simply says, I am. In one sense, Moses is simply saying, of all the gods that are there, who am I to tell the people or you that you're the ones calling them away? God doesn't even entertain his question to say, I am this God. He just simply says, I am. And that is that special covenantal name of God that we know of. In other words, God is simply saying that I am the sovereign ruler of the universe. I am God. There is no other. I am the one who made it all. I'm the one who sustains it all. I control it all. And there is not time or space or energy or people that can sway my will. I am. So we understand this revelation of knowing God personally, not only because of the sovereignty of God and how he is revealed, but also know the personalness of God that's listed here. He says, I am the Lord, your God, your God. It speaks of ownership. Certainly without a doubt, as we study the scriptures, we know that we are God simply because of creation. We are created in his image. God owns all things. He created all things. And those of us who are in Christ, we are his by redemption. But this is not speaking of God's ownership of us. He's referring to our ownership of God. He is saying that this is your God. Now, don't lose sight of that. The sovereign God of the universe, the only God who is, is the God who is your God. The ownership there that discuss helps us understand who God is and that he is our God. And he is speaking individually, as it were, to you personally. He is not the God who is out there somewhere too busy for you at times. No, he is the sovereign Lord who is actively in control in all things. He is not distant. He is not unapproachable. He is a personal God. He knows you, and he wants to be known by you. That's the context the revelation of God is the sovereign God. The relationship that is ours of his, it's a personal God, the Lord your God. And notice the second part of verse 2, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of slavery. Notice twice that phrase, out of, out of. God took them out of the land, but he also took them out of slavery. Chaplain Jeffries talked about this some last week when he mentioned about how love always precedes the law. God in his grace loved us, he chose us, he redeems us, and in redeeming, he tells us how to live. This is such the case. Exodus 19 verses four to five says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of the nations you will be my treasured possession. Love precedes law. And it's so important for us to keep this in mind because it's natural for us to think that in order for me to have the right relationship with God or a relationship with God that God would be pleased, I need to make sure that I fulfill all these commandments. And what they become is a gauge by which we are evaluating our own relationship with God. And in so doing, they become a heavy load of which we try to carry, thinking that it's through the commandments that I earn God's grace and privilege. But you have to understand this morning that is so far from the truth. Love precedes the law. God in his grace chose Abraham. God in his grace developed the nation of Israel, not based upon who Abraham was or the people of Israel were, simply because of God's choice. 
And how many of you understand here this morning that is the exact same thing of you? God chose you not based upon who you were or what you have done. He chose you simply because he is. He is a great God of grace. He is a God of love. And John Calvin helps us understand that is with that elective grace that he helps us understand that that love and that action is not in vain. There's a way that you and I ought to live. And the way we ought to live here is simply coming to understand that we are to have no other gods before us. No other gods. When we remember that where we once were and what God and his grace has done for him, there is a natural delight to seek him and obey him in this way. We see that these commandments, specifically here, the first is revealed out of knowing God personally. And then secondly, it helps us to understand this simple required action, and that is to worship God, seek God exclusively. And this is the heart, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Let me just pause here and just make a simple observation. The Ten Commandments start with God. The Ten Commandments start with God. As I mentioned, those first four are all about him. But they start with this simple understanding of placing God first in our life, worshiping him exclusively. It is highlighting the very character and nature of God of who he is and what he has done and what should be the natural response of those who have tasted and experienced that redemption. And that natural response is to worship him exclusively, to give him everything, everything. For once we get the vertical right once God is in his rightful place, every other commandment will simply fall into place. Now, looking at the commandment, the words of the Hebrew are very unique. Uh, the scripture says, you shall not have any other God before me. Any other God before me. What does that mean, before me? Literally in the Hebrew, it could mean above or over or against or in opposition to the face of God. And really there are two primary ways that people have come to interpret this. One is that we simply have no other gods before me. It's the sense of having no other gods in front of me or in my presence. It's with you. That's the kind of sense that that interpretation would lead. The other is in my face, and this is where John Calvin landed. And the in my face is that um, we, we have a total, complete allegiance to God alone. But yet when we have an attitude of God and, then we are bringing our other gods, our idols, into his presence, in before him. And so John Calvin says that when we don't give God our total and exclusive allegiance, it's like insulting him to his face. And he uses the analogy of a, of a lady who uh, would bring in her adulterer into the room with her husband, almost as a means of stabbing him in the heart, vexing him and increasing his pain. And he's simply saying that this is the mindset of this text, bringing our false idols, bringing the other things that we have in our life as we come to worship is doing the same thing. Now, there's two points to this. One is that this is not an acknowledgement of other gods. So the text is not telling us that God is just one God of many. No, God is the one and only but what it's emphasizing here is that when we elevate those things in our life, those people in our life, into the position that God should only have, we are creating God's little g. That's idols. In fact, this is what uh, Chaplain George will speak to us about next week in uh, the second commandment. You should have no graven image or, or make no idols. But the sense here, secondly, is that 
we have no other gods as long as God is our God. He is the only one. So there should be no other gods allowed in. There should be nothing else in competition in our worship, in our devotion, in our allegiance to him. Nothing can be tolerated that pulls us away from absolute allegiance to him. Let me push that just a little bit to show you uh, the thrust of what this command is saying to us. You know, there's a common cliche that we would say that God first other second, me last. We may also say God, then family, then work, and then self, right? I've said that myself. Perhaps maybe you have said that. Certainly we have others say that. The thrust of this commandment is God first, there should be no second. It is God and God alone. For when you say God first and this second, then you have already made a competition in your allegiance. It is God and God alone who is worthy of our joy, our worship, our surrender, and our service. This commandment is bringing us to help us to understand that God is worthy of of it all. And as one person has said, and I'm sure you've heard of this as well, if God is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. So how do we fulfill this commandment? What might that look like? John Calvin also in his commentary points out what he says, there's four things that we owe God. Four things that we owe God. He says we owe God adoration. The veneration and worship, he says, that we are to render him. We owe God trust, as he defines as a secure resting of him. Invocation, as the idea of uh, of retaking ourselves to his promised aid as the only resource in every case of need. We are looking to him, invoking him alone. And then lastly, he says, we owe him thanksgiving. The gratitude with which we ascribe to him the praise of all that we have received, all of our blessings. Kevin DeYoung and his book on the Ten Commandments, he picks up on these four things that Calvin brings up. And he says, you know, really to make sure that we have the right attitudes in our life and that we are striving to put God first and worship him exclusively, we can just simply take those four things and place them in terms of questions to see if God is really in the right place or maybe if we have a functional deity in our lives. He says, for adoration, we can ask ourselves, whom do you adore? Whom do you adore? Whom do you seek? What consumes your time, your energy, your your passions? Surely there's a lot of good things that can consume that. But where is God in comparison to all those things? Whom do you count on, trust Certainly God, he says, works through means such as doctors, insurance companies, and prescription medicine. But when you are in real need, who do you turn to? Who is that source? Is it the God of the universe? And then whom do you think? When all things are are going well, or even the midst when they're not, but your mind goes to the glories that is yours, that you are saved and sealed and ready for heaven. Where does your heart lie in thankfulness? Is it on him? Kevin DeYoung wraps it up and he says, questions like these help to reveal the real gods in our lives. For the one we praise, the one that we count on, the one we call for, and the one we thank is really the one that we worship. And by God's grace, may it be him, our all and all. So what does this commandment mean? Well, we We glimmer that meaning from understanding this personal relationship with him, that the God of the universe is the one who has delivered us and called us into a relationship. 
And then secondly, simply that he says that you should have no other God before me. No competition. He is all in all. So the second question, how, how can we do it? How can we fulfill this law? Well, simply, the fulfillment lies in looking to Christ uniquely. How so? Let me just say right up front, there is simply no way. There is simply no way that you can fulfill all of the commandments. You, you, you can't do it. It wasn't God's intention for you to fulfill the commandments. You will fail. The Bible even says right from the beginning in Romans chapter 3, right, that all have fallen away and that none seek God. It is because of our sinfulness, it is because of our fallen condition, we will naturally place ourselves or something else on the throne of our heart of which God alone should be. Paul also reminds us if we're guilty of breaking one, we're guilty of breaking them all. That's why the hope of us is that the Ten Commandments are not instructions on how to get out of Egypt. That wasn't the purpose of God revealing them to Moses. It wasn't like, hey, do these things and I will deliver you. God had already delivered them. And those of us in Christ have been delivered, have been saved. And so these are rules for free people to live by and stay safe and free. Luke 24, Jesus says this, everything written about me in the law of the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus is actually saying that the law is about me. The Old Testament is about me. The New Testament is about me. You read the scriptures and it is whispering his name. It is pointing us to him. Jesus fulfilled the commandments. Jesus was the one that you and I can never be and following the law completely. That's why we must look to him uniquely. We look to him as we place our faith and trust in him. He is the one that fulfills the promises. We seek to. We seek to live in such a way that would honor God following these commandments, but then again, we cannot. The word tells us that there is one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. Hebrews 1 tells us that Jesus himself is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Philippians 2 reminds us that there is one name by which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and worship, and that is Jesus alone. And what we see in the New Testament is that the Ten Commandments are transformed or rather transposed into the person of Christ. And the truth of the matter is that you and I cannot honor and glorify God without him. The implication is that if you don't know God in Christ, then you can't know God and you can't follow the commandments. So let me conclude by just simply asking this question. Do you know God? Do you know Christ? Have you come to that point in your life where you understood not that this was just a good idea, but that you need a savior? The Ten Commandments were a tutor leading us to Christ. I can't fulfill this. Jesus did. I come to him and find grace and mercy in reunion with the Father. Have you come to Christ? Is he your all in all? And if you have, is he sitting on the throne room of your life? Is there something else there that you might perhaps need to move? God is to be sought, worshipped, and enjoyed exclusively. He is number one. There can be number two. For there is only one throne in your heart and only God should reside there. May God give us the grace and strength to do just that. Will you close with me in prayer?
Fathers, we contemplate on your word and your spirit is actively at work in our hearts, granting us understanding. Oh God, have your way. Lord, we confess that we have often lived lives where you have been on par with what we would say also is number one in our life. And there certainly have been times where we have pushed you to number two and number three, and it is hard for us even to comprehend what it means to make you our all in all. We ask of God that you would grant us understanding, that your spirit would enrapture us into love and all and full obedience to you. That, Lord, that indeed that there would be no second. And that there would be no God before you, but you and you alone in our hearts and in our lives. For we ask, O oh God, that you would do this. We ask this now as we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close? I'm so, so thankful that even if we fail and we forget and we are faithless, that God remains faithful to us. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions. faithfulness again. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand has Father, we do thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, God, for your great love and grace that is ours in Christ Jesus. Lord, as we depart in this service today, we pray that you would grant us your grace to come back here again next week. As we long to, to, uh, to learn and grow in your word, we do pray your blessing and your safekeeping. We ask, oh God, that you'll watch over each as we depart here today. And we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you.